Uh, welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. A privilege to have you back again if you're joining us again. If you're joining us for the first time, let me remind you that we are the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation. We represent uh, individuals and groups who support this notion of one man, one woman, lifelong monogamous marriage. And that's, uh, that's quite something these days to support because there's all sorts of attacks on that definition going on from all sorts of angles. And the issue we're picking up on today is that issue of monogamy. And I have to tell you, it's such a privilege to have uh, a guest with us today, uh, Professor John Whitty Jr. Uh, John, would you like to say hello? Very good to see you, Tony. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, it's really, really a privilege to talk to you, John. Um, you're director, as I understand, of the uh, uh, Centre for the Study of Law and Research at Emory University Law School. And you've got a lot of other accolades. And let me just say, uh, can I encourage uh, all of our viewers to look you up and see all the things you've done and all the things you've worked on, all the interviews you've done, uh, all the articles you've published. It really is an astonishing amount of work. Uh, we're going to focus, I think, today on uh, one of your books, and that's the, uh, the Western Case for Monogamy over Polygamy. Uh, and as we start, I have to say, um, I, I read your book, a uh, wonderful book, uh, very accessible, uh, taking the case for um, monogamy over polygamy from uh, way back in antiquity right up to the modern day. I think it's like 600 pages or something. And I have to say, John, uh, I felt I'd accomplished something when I'd finished reading that book yet you wrote it. <laughs> and that's not the only book you've written of such stature in your life, or even the only subject. You've just done so much. So I wonder if I can start. How on earth do you get that sort of work done on a repeat basis and so many different subjects to such a high standard that even governments in different countries call on you as a renowned world expert in these things? How on earth do you do it? Well, thank you so much. It's uh, one to be blessed with a uh, uh, wonderful opportunity to do this in our Center for the Study of Law and Religion, which I've been directing for the last 38 years and having a support system, having a variety of colleagues who are a part of the community uh, of conversation, having uh, wonderful students over many years to be able to do this work. Um, secondly, I love it. And I feel it's my Christian vocation to be working uh, in this row or two of the vineyard that I've been assigned uh, and I get up at four o'clock every morning and write, which is uh, my great love, uh, before I get into the work of the day to run the center, to teach my students, to engage in other things. Um, I early on was uh, privileged to think about the marriage and family and uh, field uh, when I focused on the Protestant Reformation and what changes it introduced in uh, Western law. And marriage and family proved to be one of the definitive areas of contestation between the medieval church and the budding Protestant Reformation. Uh, and starting with that work of the early 1980s, uh, realized that one could look backward into the tradition uh, to antiquity and classical times and biblical times and look forward to the latest machinations by uh, high courts to realize marriage, family, sexuality uh, were central questions of identity, central questions of practice, central questions of the law and theology world. And so that has been one area where I've spent a great deal of my time. Um, I work on faith, freedom, and family, the three things people will die for. And I've been privileged to do that uh, with a great blessing from um, the good Lord first, uh, from my family uh, second, and from the university that has uh, housed me uh, since the beginning of my career in 1985. Do you know, if, if I had a hat, I would have worn it today so I could have taken it off. <laughs> <In your Thank honor. laughs> but wonderful. So we're, we're looking at this concept, all being well, do you know, I'd love to, if you have the time to talk to you about other things you've written about pertaining to marriage, because they are so important. Uh, but today we're looking at this concept of polygamy, uh, monogamy, uh, and something which is coming up in the media again. We've had lots of uh, TV programs uh, almost on a daily basis in our country now. There are articles in the, the mainstream press uh, about uh, uh, polygamy, people should give it a go, and actually monogamy is, you know, it's, it's old fashioned, etc. We'll, we'll be talking through some of these issues, but something interesting you said uh, in one of your uh, online interviews that I listened to, in addition to the book, uh, uh, last week, sometime, a long time ago, I think the interview was, um, but you made the point that, uh, of course, 
polygamy is is against the law in our country and in most uh, Western liberal democracies, it's against the law. Uh, so if, if a Muslim man wanted four wives, he couldn't have four wives. But if uh, another man wanted to simultaneously sleep with four different women and have children, uh, yet not owe them anything in terms of care, uh, that's perfectly permissible. And that was a strange situation to be in. Um, I wonder, could you just pick up on that, first of all, as a, as a societal anomaly? Yeah, so a few things in uh, that uh, wonderful introduction to this issue. Um, yes, monogamy versus polygamy is one area where um, the Western tradition has had uh, a great deal of work to do over uh, the centuries. Uh, I've written a lot on the history of marriage and family life from antiquity till today. Uh, the strong monogamous ideal, the strong heterosexual ideal of marriage, and then always the anomalies. And I've worked on issues of uh, non-marital children or bastardy, as unfortunately it was called in the tradition in a book called The Sins of the Fathers. Uh, I've worked on issues of marital property. Uh, I've worked on the question of children's rights and how they sit. And all of those oftentimes run into the question of polygamy. Uh, and polygyny is the proper term, one man with multiple wives, polyamory, a rarer but occasional instance of one woman with multiple husbands. Uh, that, that issue has been in the tradition for a very long time. Uh, Pre-Christian, uh, Rome and Greece uh, spent time fussing with the question of uh, whether one man could have multiple spouses or spouse-like um, parties called concubines. And Roman law early on uh, decided that a man could have one wife or one concubine, but not both. And otherwise it would be a form of domestic tyranny. Uh, in the third century, uh, Rome chose to make uh, polygamy in a pre-Christian context, a form of infamy. And it's been a crime in the Western tradition since the third century and continues to be a crime in most Western lands and non-Western lands to this day. Uh, virtually all parts of the West, the European heartland, and then its colonial extensions overseas uh, has, polyg has prohibited polygamy. Uh, it continues to be prohibited in Russia and China and other major parts of the world. Uh, but the reality is, as you say in your, your comment, the reality as we know it is that we, with sexual liberty emerging in the last 50 years uh, under constitutional and cultural norms, we have the anomaly that uh, the law against polygamy remains in the books but the practice protected by constitutional norms is that parties can hold, have and hold uh, multiple spouses at once, de facto. Uh, and that raises the hard question about, well, whether the law should change or whether the prohibitions against multiple spouses simultaneously should change, de facto. Uh, and we are left in the 20th and 21st century uh, in Western Europeans and um, North American and Latin American lands with trying to solve that anomaly in, in appropriate ways. And we do that in part by uh, continuing to signal in the law the importance of monogamous marriage, to try to incentivize that through a set of nudges that encourage parties to get married and to stay married, uh, to privilege the relationship between uh, marital parties and their natural or adopted children. Uh, and to discourage and sometimes to penalize, at least through private sanction, uh, various forms of extramarital or postmarital uh, contexts that give rise, especially to children. Um, the hard question is, what do you do with the liberties uh, of sexual equality and self-determination uh, with the reality of foreign parties, especially from Muslim lands or from the African uh, polygyny belt in the central part of Africa, what do you do with those immigrant communities when they come to um, Western countries, the United States, the UK, and elsewhere? Uh, and how do we deal with that relationship that they brought with them? We still insist that uh, they come with one spouse, even though we will allow them to continue to maintain uh, a marital household with multiple parties, the second through uh, whatever number, uh, being by definition, not spouses. We still continue to uh, set up our inheritance and tax and social security and other systems with that goal in mind. Uh, my suspicion is, is that uh, we will retain that for a time. Uh, I don't see the US and the UK and Western European lands changing their minds about this, uh, but we will as a consequence continue to live with the anomaly of the jury 
monogamy only and de facto polygamous practices uh, in multiple households. Um, That's, I, yeah. This is right at the edge of where family law uh, and constitutional law of self-determination uh, and religious freedom law, when um, Muslims in particular press uh, for polygamy and sometimes Latter-day Saints groups press for polygamy uh, on religious freedom grounds. Right in that intersection is where this issue is being joined legally uh, and culturally. And you're right, finally, to say that we have uh, continued to use um, the media, uh, public relations, other various um, vehicles of communication uh, to press the case, to destigmatize polygamy, uh, to uh, privilege the exotic, to think of this as kind of edgy and interesting, uh, countercultural, anti authoritarian, or anti institutional. And that reality. Uh, is part of um, the culture wars around this issue that have been joined a bit, uh, and I think will continue to be joined in the aftermath of the acceptance of same-sex marriage. Some of the rhetoric um, today, uh, well, I would say emerging, but it's not really emerging. It's been there for a, a long time. Is this concept that, well, actually um, monogamy is a misogynistic social construct. Uh, not even the Bible in the Old Testament was monogamous. Uh, all of the patriarchs had many wives. Uh, you can you can identify many cultures in civilizations past and present who practice polygamy. And so therefore, actually, it was just a, a misogynistic social construct uh, never really existed as a thing in and of itself. Um, that's a wonderful rhetoric, but it's not the reality. Um, and over 2,500 years in the Western tradition and over a longer period of time in non-Western traditions, monogamy has been the norm that is considered to be the most expedient form uh, of relationship uh, for the long term, the best way by which to produce uh, healthy children and to pass on one's inheritance to those children, uh, the best way to foster the equality of husband and wife uh, in a household home, and rather than putting multiple spouses in competition for the affection of one uh, patriarch in the family, rather than leaving children uh, with uh, fragmented affection uh, directed to them uh, and to their competing mothers in the same household, uh, many traditions in the, in the West and the non-West have chosen the monogamous household as the best way to go. It's the best way of taking care of women it's the best way of taking care of children, and ironically, it's the best way of taking care of men, to reduce them uh, to the commitment to this one spouse, to reduce them to uh, the insistence on protecting their own children and not dissipating their wealth and dissipating their resources over multiple uh, spouses and multiple children. The other thing that the tradition has made very clear uh, in the West and the non-West is with the reality of roughly uh, one male, one to one male female ratios in a community um, to exclude a number of males from uh, participation in uh, the marital uh, relationships because uh, one man who happens to be the wealthiest but not necessarily the fittest or the most morally expedient uh, hoards multiple spouses that inevitably is going to lead to a variety of forms of seduction and prostitution and other forms of untoward conduct that those males will engage in. And the final thing that we recognize in the tradition is this interesting natural law argument that Thomas Aquinas building on Augustine and Aristotle um, made powerful and that has echoes in other non-Western cultures, which is the reality of, of pair bonding strategies given uh, our natural conditions as humans. Um, here are some of the conditions that Aquinas lifts up, building on the tradition. Number one, um, humans are perennially sexually active, especially when they're young and they're most fertile. Unlike many other animals, uh, humans have a perennial sex drive. They don't have an intense mating season where it's hot and heavy for a month and the rest of the time everybody's relaxing. Humans are constantly... Um, have a constant appetite for sex. Number two, humans, unlike many other animals, produce tiny little beings called babies 
that take up to a third of their life to become independent and be able to live on their own. They don't produce uh, progeny that can get up and walk away or swim away or fly away after a couple of weeks of protection. They need care for a great deal of their life. Third, um, women attach to their progeny naturally. There's a natural inclination to attach. Men do not. Men will invest in their children only if they have uh, certainty about their paternity. Uh, and number four, humans, especially males, are incapable of engaging in sexually destructive behavior for their own gratification. Mm -hmm. You put those four factors together, perennial sex drives, tiny beings that need care, differential attachment to progeny, uh, and capacity to engage in sexually destructive behavior, especially by males. Um, the argument that Aquinas lays out is, it turns out pair bonding strategies of reproduction and faithfulness to a relationship called monogamy is the very best way for the species to be advanced. Uh, it allows for a continued perennially sexual human being to engage in sex, uh, it allows for the child that is born of that union to be cared for. Uh, it assures a man that if they're faithful to a monogamous relationship, they, as a consequence, can be certain of their paternity, and it will quell their uh, appetite for engaging in sexually destructive behavior. That argument, the kind of natural facts of human nature and human sexuality and reproduction, is at the core uh, of the Western argument uh, for uh, monogamy rather than polygamy. And natural justice arguments, natural rights arguments, and others get added alongside. You can find parallels to that in Chinese culture, uh, in uh, other uh, deep traditions uh, of the West and non-West. Uh, and it's part of the long tradition of discussion of marriage, family, sexuality that informs the pre-enlightenment, the post-enlightenment, and indeed even our postmodern cultural discussions of this. It's not misogyny. It is not patriarchy. It is in many ways the most natural form uh, of relationship, especially for reproductive purposes. And how much do you think things like um, contraception, surrogacy, uh, state benefits for single parents, how much has that um, uh, caused some of the, the thinking that's going on in, 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 let's call it, what they call themselves progressive parts of society, um, or how much of it is, is just argument to undermine the concept of, of um, monogamy? There's no question that you put your finger on a hard uh, reality around that traditional argument that surrogacy, uh, paternal certainty through genetic testing, uh, various kinds of adoption uh, are all uh, mitigants against that quote unquote natural condition of monogamy. Um, the turning to the welfare state to do the work traditionally done by uh, kin networks based upon a monogamous union is an experiment of the last century. And it's on increasingly the fiscal and ideological ropes. Um, we turn to the social welfare state to do much of the work historically done by the marriage-based kinship structures that were out there and other non-state associations that were part of the uh, care for the parents, care for the child, care for the elderly. Um, that experiment, which emerged in the early part of the 20th century in the Good Society and the New Deal and other projects, um, has certainly passed on a lot of the consequences and costs of sexual liberation. Um, and in one sense, that's a good. Uh, more justice is being done, more care is being given, more stewardship is being applied on behalf of the society to the needy, the vulnerable, the poor, the widow, the orphan. Uh, but the reality is, is that if we continue to pass on the costs of non-marital sex and non-marital procreation and non-marital union uh, to the welfare state, I'm afraid that in the 20th, 21st century, by 2050, we're going to be having to think anew about how this works because the social welfare state cannot deliver on all the promises and all the responsibilities that we have hoisted on it in the last hundred years. Um, we see that already in bankruptcies in a number of states, the fraying of the social welfare system, the bottom third of society suffering badly as a consequence of bureaucratic tangle. Um, 
the pressure that many Western social welfare states have on themselves, the experiments in Russia and the 20th century and China still today on using the state uh, as an, ex an alternative parent, an alternative um, uh, system of structure uh, for education, care, charity, welfare, and the like. Uh, and the reality is, is that while it's there and important as a supplement to, it cannot supplant, uh, in my view, the uh, role played uh, and the indispensable care given by uh, the marital family as the foundation for um, the next generation success. And there's plenty of evidence, uh, empirical evidence to show that the non-marital child or the child that is born into or, or becomes a part of a broken family has a very difficult time on average compared to his or her um, peers in intact uh, marital households. So yes, the scientific foundation of this old natural law argument makes it shakier, but I think the broader moral import and teleology of that argument continues to be strong uh, and in my view, convincing. So what about uh, uh, the, the concept of, uh, I suppose, two concepts. Uh, one would be serial monogamy. So somebody who has a long-term relationship then moves on to another long-term relationship uh, and or uh, monogamous relationships between same-sex couples. Uh, how would those both those examples differentiate from the, the one man, one woman, lifelong monogamous thing? Yeah, so the serial monogamy um, question is a, uh, the more the diff, more difficult one in the tradition, a place where Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox, let alone people of other faith traditions, uh, have differences. Um, serial monogamy viewed as a party who has a relationship that ends and then enters into another relationship that um, allows them uh, and their adopted or stepchildren to continue to have an intact household um, is one form that the tradition inherits from uh, both Jewish um, biblical law texts as well as from uh, classical Greco-Roman texts. And uh, the idea of divorce or death uh, providing an alternative or a, a, a new license and right to engage in a new marriage is one form of uh, relationship, uh, serial relationships that the tradition has recognized to be uh, appropriate. Uh, even St. Paul, when he talks about widows and encouraging widowers to stay widows, nonetheless makes exceptions for those that have children. And the early church fathers kind of wrestle with that question. Um, divorce is a hard issue that continues to divide uh, Christian communities. It divided them historically, too. Uh, we recognize from Deuteronomy 24, uh, a Jewish tradition that was Talmudically layered by the time we get to the time of Jesus, that talks uh, about a man being able to dismiss his wife uh, who no longer pleases him and to enter into a new relationship except with his former spouse, um, serial monogamy and actual polygamy were part of the Jewish tradition at the time. Uh, Jesus comes along and rebukes that, uh, but Jesus ultimately says in Matthew 19, um, that divorce for cause, especially adultery, might be appropriate. And St. Paul embroiders that a bit in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, uh, recognizing desertion and perhaps the appropriate um, relationship afterward uh, being for those parties that have been deserted. And the tradition is not, has oscillated between uh, no uh, remarriage except after death to remarriage after death and divorce, and the Orthodox and Protestant traditions have taken the wrong form of that. Some church fathers and subsequent traditions of theological thought have called that uh, serial monogamy or serial polygamy. Uh, others have seen that as an appropriate means to recognize that the marital institution is a good, and if it needs to be repeated after death or divorce, that good is something to uh, celebrate rather than something to denigrate. I happen to come out of a Protestant tradition that recognizes marriage as a, a covenant, uh, which has conditional performance in it, uh, that recognizes it's not an idol to be worshipped come what may, but it is a tradition of fidelity uh, that once breached can rise, give rise to a second tradition of fidelity. Uh, that does not uh, encourage multiple uh, simultaneous uh, 
forms of fidelity, uh, which is what polygamy does. And in my view, it does not include um, having relationships that are predicated on uh, gender uh, identity. Um, when the question then about what do you do with not polygamous marriage, but same-sex marriage, um, there I think the Christian tradition is, at least the biblical tradition, is much more clearly in strong denunciation of that kind of relationship, let alone that kind of uh, form of marriage. I mean, we have the passages in Leviticus 18 and 20 and Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians uh, 6 and 1 Timothy 1, all of which are pretty condemnatory uh, of same-sex relationships or actions or sexual activities, let alone uh, the idea of same-sex marriage. While polygamy is a little wobbly in the tradition from the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament, um, same-sex relationships in general, let alone same-sex marriage, really is not contemplated. Well, the classic biblical text in Genesis 2.24 that Jesus repeats in Matthew 19 that says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, underscores both the monogamy of the relationships and the heterosexuality of the relationships. Um, and the Hebrew Bible's exposition repeatedly, and especially the prophets, about the relationship between Yahweh and his chosen people being a covenantal relationship that is deeply, deeply monogamous and insistent upon the bride of Israel and the husband uh, of Yahweh. And that echoed in the New Testament ideal of Christ being the bride and Jesus being the bridegroom. I think really underscores for Christians uh, the found, foundational monogamous and heterosexual ideals that were with, that exist in this relationship, uh, ideally for life, ideally with mutual fidelity, uh, and with recognition that occasional breaches, as the covenant model would have us believe, and in my view, the New Testament also allows occasional breaches or ending by death. Uh, allowing for an alternative union. And, and I would love to talk to you more sometime about covenant versus contract and the, the change, etc. that's that's taken place, because that, that in itself is a, a really key concept for Christians, non-Christians. Many of our supporters come from uh, different religions and no religion whatsoever. You also raised the, the point of uh, earlier on, the idea of growing up with your biological parents and, and the difference that makes. Um, Statistically, no matter what uh, the other relationship, statistically, you're much better off, you're much safer, uh, radically so, growing up with your biological mum and dad. But I I'm wondering, just pushing this on a little bit further then, um, we live in a, a, a liberal democracy uh, as, as much as it is these days. Um, classical liberalism, I'm not sure where that's gone as a thought these days, but is it an inevitable conclusion, if you like? So um, terms like fornication, um, adultery, um, sodomy, let's, let's use the, the, the older terms, if you like. Uh, those things are all legal and accepted now. Is it almost like um, uh, an unavoidable consequence that a liberal democracy becomes more liberal? And as it gets more liberal for ever smaller, smaller groups, it ends up having to, to restrain bigger groups and the way they act and think uh, in order to accommodate the smaller groups. Is it almost uh, an inevitable conclusion that that's the way liberal democracy is going to go? Perhaps. I mean, you, you can, uh, what the Constitution has, uh, constitutional interpretation has said is that fornication and adultery and sodomy and buggery and all the things that we classically call sex crimes uh, are no longer sex crimes. Uh, but the, the even liberal democracy has not said that those are goods to be uh, pursued uh, with um, encouragement by the state and with nudging by the state and even with reward by the state. Uh, so far, the liberal democracy is, says you have the freedom to make those decisions for yourself rather than you have the right to do this and we will facilitate the exercise of that right. And I think that's important to draw a distinction uh, between what the state encourages and what the state allows. Um, secondly, um, for parties that choose to step out of the cultural uh, dominant positions on these questions, um, especially if they're religiously grounded, uh, have an equally important right uh, called religious freedom. And religious freedom is a fundamental right that needs to be protected in every liberal democracy uh, that every constitution has in place as one of the foundational rights 
and which cannot uh, be sacrificed uh, when juxtaposed to alternative sexual liberty claims to put the generically uh, those concerns in under one roof. Um, sexual liberty and religious liberty sit, sit side by side in liberal democracies and religious communities or cultural communities that insist upon uh, practicing their sexuality in a particular way need to be given the freedom and indeed must be given the freedom uh, under international and constitutional domestic laws to have the protection to insist on it as a condition for membership in their community and indeed um, uh, have the right to uh, make uh, membership in the community condition on that such that if the party is ostracized in the community by nonviolent means, uh, the ostracism is something that the state has to respect. Uh, in this sense, the state does not have a monopoly on the legality or the law governing uh, sex, marriage, and family life. The state has to yield to the realities that other sovereigns sit alongside it including the sovereignty of religious communities. Um, that raises the hard question about, well, what if those internal religious communities have different norms from the state? Can the state set minimum conditions of what is appropriate for a citizen, regardless of what other religious communities or cultural communities he or she is a part of? And in my view, yes, the state sets a baseline upon what's accepted or not accepted as a member of being a member of society. You cannot engage in wife abuse or child sacrifice or polygamy or other forms of um, domestic abuse, as we would call it at secular law, just because your religion says so. And in that sense, in my view, every religious community has a certain baseline of conduct vis-a-vis -vis its members that it must insist on, but religious communities are permitted to go above that baseline uh, in insisting upon certain moral behavior within their communities as a condition for ongoing membership. That may cost them members down the road, but in my view, it is the best way to live by the light of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. It's interesting because um, we, we, of course, in the UK don't have a constitution in the way that you do in the US, a very clear written out document. Uh, and all sorts of things are happening over here uh, in terms of free speech. We've got uh, a proposed ban on so-called conversion therapy which threatens to criminalize anybody, even parents, doing anything apart from endorsing and celebrating uh, either some uh, a child's a transgender uh, a choice or, or, or a gay or lesbian lifestyle, uh, or if somebody goes to a, a church or something else like that, potentially that church could find itself accused of coercive conversion therapy if it says, for example, marriage should be between one man and one woman. So, you know, there are there are significant threats on the horizon in terms of, like you say, religious liberty and freedom of speech. And some would argue, well, actually, uh, in a liberal democracy, so all are kept safe because, of course, um, words can be violence these days and violence is often accepted as legitimate protest, ironically. Uh, so th there are some interesting uh, things happening. I just wondered if you had any comments around those sorts of things. Yeah, no, no question that uh, we are very much in, in um, a transitional time in our recognition of liberty or rights, and whether they're set out in primitive constitutional texts like the 14th Amendment Due Process and Equal Protection and Free Exercise Clause or set out in your 1988 uh, 98 Human Rights Act, um, they provide the foundation for discussion about how those rights should be exercised in society, to what extent can the state uh, through the legislature or the judiciary set limits on them uh, for reasons of health, safety, welfare, for the protection of the fundamental rights of others. Those dialectics are always part of any kind of rights system in action. Um, and in the United States, we are in a time when the swing of the constitutional pendulum is very much back toward the more robust protection of religious freedom uh, and that other rights, when they collide, need be um, balanced by and sometimes even subordinated to the religious freedom rights of an individual or a group. That's very different from what was 20 years ago when it seemed that religious freedom was becoming a second class right and that when there was a collision between the exercise of an individual or group's religious freedom rights versus another fundamental right, especially around sexual liberty, 
the sexual liberty right trumped. That pendulum has now swung back. And I dare say the same thing may well happen in the UK and Western European lands more generally, um, perhaps prompted by changes in cultural and condition in the UK, uh, perhaps uh, animated by, um, for better or worse, the European uh, Court of Human Rights jurisprudence that has also oscillated on this question. Um, the, cults, the legal dynamics uh, in the UK are um, dramatically different, uh, especially in um, having left the European Union where the Court of Justice of the European Union also had bearing in place. Um, but you're quite right that currently in the UK and some other Western European lands, um, less um, robust free speech norms um, on the one side and a very, very strong privileging uh, of same-sex liberty on the other um, is changing some of the calculus of making religious organizations um, more nervous about their ability to have the autonomy uh, and the freedom to be able to do things on their own. I'm a constitutional historian and I would say um, constant Constitutions swing, um, there's an old adage by John Adams, that great American founder who said, in order to work properly, constitutions, uh, constitutions are like clocks. In order to work properly, the pendulum has to swing back and forth uh, and occasionally the operators have to get wound up. And that really has happened in the United States and I dare say it may happen in the UK and other Western European lands as well, where the pendulum is gonna swing back and forth a little bit. And right now you're on the pretty far, far arch of the pendulum swing uh, in favor of same-sex liberty at the cost in some sense of, or sexual liberty more generally, at the cost in some sense of religious freedom. It is important finally to say, I'm sorry, forgive me for just making one more point, it is really important that religious communities, especially Christian churches, live up to their moral ideals. Uh, and the Christian churches have not helped themselves. Uh, in recent decades uh, by the various scandals that have attached to some of the behavior of their leadership. Uh, and that has not helped uh, the cause of religious freedom. That's not only true of the UK, true of the US and many churches worldwide. Uh, but it is important if you want to claim a religious freedom right to engage in morally different behavior, to engage in that morally different behavior consistently as possible within the limits of human um, sinfulness. I, I couldn't agree with those points more. It, it, absolutely. For, for people to stand up and uh, live the lives they should be living, to say the things they should be saying, do and, and, and act and avoid the things they should be avoiding, etc., etc. Um, absolutely right. What, um, one of the issues we've got, which seems to be emerging, is, is very much a lived experience um, evidence base. So uh, my truth and that kind of concept. Uh, you know, uh, logic, it's almost like post enlightenment. We don't want your logic. We don't want your evidence. And the fact that you try and use those things and your natural arguments for polygamy uh, just shows that you're actually part of the problem. It's almost like the, the, the witch trials. You know, if, uh, if a woman uh, drowned, she was innocent. If it lived, she meant she, it meant she was a witch and you had to kill her another way. Uh, it's like you can't win. You can't win. So I'm just wondering uh, two things. First of all, uh, where do you think it's it's heading uh, and what can we do about it? And you've just touched on one of the things we can do about it. And that's for those who, who are Christians, who uh, whose other faith traditions support monogamous marriage to live up to those virtues. But two things as we as we conclude, then where are we going as a society? Uh, you're obviously not a prophet, but you might be able to to give some thought to that. Uh, and also, what can we do about it? Yeah, I'm a historian, not a prophet, and uh, so I have to be a little careful about making any predictions. Um, a few things. One, I would say this kind of epistemological state of nature uh, where everything is atomistic, everything is nominalistic, everything is self-defined uh, and self-determined uh, is not an enduring way to live as a polity and live as a society. Uh, and we might, ironically, in the West, uh, be rebuked by um, our former uh, mission stations, <laughs> now new powerhouses in the Christian tradition uh, in the global south, uh, who may well be rethinking the tradition, may well be rethinking how we uh, interpret scripture and the like uh, to uh, give us a, uh, an alternative way 
and in many ways, an, a new iteration of uh, former teachings and, and practices of our old tradition. Secondly, uh, I do think it critical for people of faith, including the people of the Christian faith, uh, to be faithful to the truths that they have been given, to the teachings of the, uh, the great prophets of the tradition historically, uh, and to recognize that we have uh, a 2,000-year tradition uh, predicated on certain foundational truths set out in the scripture. That tradition, uh, however, is a living tradition. Uh, and Yaroslav Pelikan's idea that tradition is the living faith of the dead, traditionalism is the dead faith of the living, is a critical part of um, how we should live as people with scripture and with tradition guiding us. Um, we need to make the tradition remain alive uh, to the next generation. We need to continue to teach its enduring truths, but at the same time recognize the multiple ways in which those truths uh, need to be communicated to people of the same faith, of different faiths, and of no faith or of anti-faith uh, in a way that is cogent, in a way that is charitable, in a way that is clear uh, about the values of being in community. I think third, um, we need to remember our traditions. Um, we tend to um, forget about the great church fathers, forget about the teachings and wisdom uh, of the medieval schoolmen, of the Protestant reformers of the 18th and 19th and early 20th century um, figures that um, continue to adapt and to grow the tradition to take up new questions. And at the same time, we have to realize that in the 18th and 19th century, when the Enlightenment liberal architects were putting in place most of the premises of uh, legal, moral, and political life, uh, almost all of those Enlightenment reformers uh, maintained the basic teachings about sex, marriage, and family in the Western tradition. Uh, to look to Enlightenment liberalism as the foundation for modern sexual antinomianism uh, is in many ways a fool's errand. Uh, the 17th through 19th century figures in the Enlightenment tradition that spoke to sex, marriage, and family rejected scripture, rejected simple Christian tradition, but accepted almost all of the basic sex, marriage, and family project uh, that in, they inherited from Greco-Roman times, inherited from the Christian tradition, uh, and put in place utilitarian and uh, rational and other arguments to hold that up. Uh, a book that I just published called Church, State, and Family Reconciling Tradition uh, and Modern Liberty uh, is designed to lift up uh, that symbiosis between Christian teachings and Enlightenment liberal teachings around the sex, marriage, and family question and come to appreciate that the tradition um, about the cores of monogamy, the cores of fidelity, the need for sex crimes, the need to nudge and support um, the heterosexual monogamous family are something that pre-Christians, Christians, and post-Christians alike uh, have endorsed uh, to, for the good of society uh, and for the better pursuit of justice. And appreciating that in the 21st century, I think, is really important for Western liberal lands as well. Absolutely brilliant and succinct and a, a great place to, to maybe end. Um, can I just let everyone know that um, uh, we've, we've barely scratched the surface of your your book, The uh, Western Case for Monogamy. I would encourage people to read that, to get whatever work they can from you and, uh, and read it yourself. Is there anything you think you'd like to direct us to, any websites or any uh, other materials that you think we should go away and read? Well, first and foremost, I wanna thank you for this interview and to uh, commend the wonderful work that you and your organization are doing. And the best website is your own website uh, and the work that, um, that is reflected there. Um, my own work, uh, is uh, set out in my own personal website, which I think will be attached to the video of this. It's just all lowercase John Whitty Jr. Period dot com. Uh, and it's just a repository of uh, the work that I've been doing in the faith, freedom, and family field for a long time and links to the various books and reviews and the like. Um, if any of your readers want to uh, get in touch with me uh, or listeners want to get in touch with me, please feel free to email me at Emory Law School. Simply look me up and you can find me there and I'd be happy to uh, address any concerns folks might have. Um, uh, life's busy. And so please, please forgive me if you have to send your message two or three times before you get through. Uh, a few hundred emails a day are always the wonderful start of the morning. But I do enjoy this, uh, uh, did enjoy this opportunity to talk with you and I do appreciate what you are doing in your work and 
God bless you and those continued efforts. It's a real privilege. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. All right. God bless you. Bye-bye.